Um, I want to talk uh, some more about uh, reactions that we do with organohalogen compounds. Um, some of this is uh, some of the review of that uh, video, but not all of those details. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a little bit uh, further on in the reactions for this chemistry. Um, so when we when we think about organohalogen compounds, we know that the carbon halogen bond uh, creates a situation where we have imparted reactivity to the carbon group. Um, so when we have a carbon bromine bond, for example, uh, the bromine atom is more electronegative than carbon. So the bond is polarized towards the bromine. That means the carbon is partially positive charged. Uh, and the bromine end is partially negative charge. So the electron density in that bond, those electrons are closer to the bromine than the carbon, leading to this polarization of the bond. And that generates a situation where we can do reactions. So one of the things to think about is that halogen compounds uh, are electrophiles. They're electrophilic. That is, um, we, when we talk about this, the reactivity of that carbon atom it's seeking electron density because it's deficient. And so when you come along with something that's electron rich, like for example in this, in this case a hydroxide ion, uh, you can expect some reaction because here we have electron rich species and here we have an electron, electron poor species, that, particularly at that carbon, right? Uh, and you should expect a reaction there. And there are a couple of different types of common reactions that these organohalogens undergo. Um, and it's a little bit gray area about which of these processes will uh, take place. It depends a lot on several factors, including the structure, the particular structure of your electrophile, the alkyl halide, the particular nature of your electron-rich species. It could be a base, or it could be a nucleophile. We're going to talk a little bit more about nucleophiles, um, things that are seeking uh, nucleus, right? It has electron density, it wants to share. Um, and those two properties actually are a little bit different. They often go hand in hand, but they're different. Basicity and nucleophilicity are different. So in this reaction on the top, we've exchanged a carbon bromine bond that bond has been broken, and we've replaced it with, a, in this case, a carbon oxygen bond. So that's a substitution reaction. So uh, alkyl halide plus hydroxide gives an alcohol plus bromide as the byproduct. Okay. Notice I've neglected to write in here. This is not OH minus by itself. It's probably something like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So the actual product in the end, the byproduct, the inorganic byproduct, would be sodium or potassium bromide or whatever that counter ion was. But that's a substitution reaction. That's where the electrophile, the alkyl halide, reacts with the hydroxide and the hydroxide is behaving as a nucleophile. Uh, in the second uh, case here, there's another common reaction from alkyl halide, and that is if the electrophilic alkyl halide species, instead of substituting the CBr bond with, with a bond to something else, we've essentially eliminated something else from the molecule to fill in that electron density. So in this case, we do an elimination. Um, the byproduct here overall would be, essentially we've lost H and Br from the molecule that we started with in the form of bromide and water. That's an elimination reaction. So this atom has come off and that atom has come off. And one of the common features of an elimination reaction, notice those are on adjacent carbons. Okay, They don't come off necessarily from the same carbon, they come off from adjacent carbons. Because that partially plus carbon um, could be fulfilled by a nucleophile adding to it, or it could be fulfilled by the electrons from this bond going down, losing an H plus. 
So a base could pluck off that H plus instead of actually kicking off the bromine. We're going to talk to a lot of details about these two kinds of reactions and the specifics that we see for those. Many factors influence which pathway takes place. The, as I said, the substrate, we're talk, we'll talk about that. Um, the specific nucleophile or base we're working with. Uh, and many other things like the solvent medium can influence this, the temperatures, uh, the type of base you have, all these things can affect the outcome of which pathway that takes. Notice we're starting with the same starting material here and there are two possibilities for reactions. We need to find a way to understand what controls the path, right? So let's talk a little bit about the nucleophilic substitution reaction. As I said, we have an electrophile and a nucleophile. And this could be many different things. Uh, this chapter is focused on alkyl halides, so organohalogen compounds. So in that case, we have a carbon-halogen bond, and we know we have four halogens that uh, up here on the periodic table. Um, these halogens react differently based on the difference in the bond strengths. Okay, so remember last week we talked a little bit about how the larger the halogen, the longer the bond, and actually that makes for a weaker bond. So if the bond is longer, it's, it's, it tends to be weaker and more reactive. So those tend to be better substrates for doing substitution or elimination reactions. So iodine is better than bromine, better than chlorine, better than fluorine. We've seen some other electrophilic species that behave in similar reactions in the past, um, not alkyl halides. What else have we seen that do similar types of reactions? Do you remember these three membrane ring oxygen compounds? And I told you we could open it up by attacking it with nucleophiles. So notice, that's exactly the same reaction as a nucleophile reacting with an alkyl halide. Instead, we have a polarized carbon-oxygen bond that's also strained, so that bond is weak. It can leave its, with its electrons and a nucleophile can attack. Oftentimes, we protonate this to make that better. That was from uh, a previous chapter. Um, so what, what about nucleophiles? What about the, the species that we're actually reacting in with the electron-rich part of this? So in this case, I've generically just used a Y minus to mean a generic electron-rich species. Um, and there are many, many kinds of nucleophiles. I've listed a few here for you. Hydroxide, as I, as I showed you on the previous slide, can be a nucleophile. Um, if that's instead of an OH minus, there's some carbon group next to it. That's an alkoxide. What we refer to as an alkoxide. From, it's a negatively charged oxygen species from an alcohol. Uh, carboxylic acid. This is a, a, a CO2 minus. So let me draw this out so you get an idea about the actual structure. That's a carboxylate anion. Um, thiols um, or, or thiol anions, cyanide, CN minus. The structure looks like this. CN minus. Azide, that's a great nucleophile. Azide and cyanide, those are two very good nucleophiles. Um, We've seen other nucleophiles in the previous chapters, too. Right? We know that we can take an alkyne and deprotonate it with a base, so you can make the negative charge. And those react with alkyl halides. So we actually saw this substitution reaction earlier, but we didn't have it in the context of alkyl halides in particular. Um, so all these things can react as nucleophiles. Or they could react as a Bronsted base. Okay, so what kinds of features might uh, make something more basic or more nucleophilic? 
I mean, one thing you hopefully have seen, you know, if you've ever done work in the laboratory or, is, or done uh, chemistry, you've seen sodium hydroxide, we refer to that as a base, right? Because it's a, it's a pretty basic material. It, it reacts with and deprotonates things and takes protons quite easily. Um, and so I've sort of listed these in order on here of stronger base on the left in terms of its properties. On this side, there's stronger bases or react more like a base. And on the right side, they are better nucleophiles and weaker bases. So what we see is that when we have charges that are um, tightly bound, and you think about the electronegativity of an oxygen atom, we have those charges which are localized and tightly bound. They tend to be more basic and react more like a Bronsted base. If the atom is larger, and I want to compare just the OH minus versus the, H, the SH minus, those are essentially identical, except sulfur is one uh, row lower on the periodic table, right? They have different properties. The sulfur tends to be a better nucleophile, in other words, forming a covalent bond with something like a carbon that's electrophilic, whereas the hydroxide is more uh, a better base, relative, if you compare those two directly. And that's because the sulfur is a larger atom. You have one more shell if you go down and down the periodic table. The negative charge in the valence shell is further away from the nucleus. It's more easily moved. It's not held as tight. It's something we refer to as um, softness of those electrons. Um, those tend to be, if they're not held as tightly by a nucleus, they tend to be easier to form covalent bonds and more nucleophilic. So it's a, a general property we see uh, when we see things like that. The more electrons are spread out, the negative charge is spread out, the better it is at a, as a nucleophile versus a base, because it's more easily shifted to form a covalent bond. And that's kind of a simplistic way to view it, but that's, that's the observations that we see when we deal with different kinds of nucleophiles. Um, so that's why we see these as more basic on the left, and those species tend to be more uh, nucleophilic on the right. But it really is a spectrum. There's no black and white. It's really gray. And you combine any of these nucleophiles with the specifics of a specific electrophile, the nature of the electrophile and how easily you can do one pathway or the other will also affect things. Unfortunately, chemistry is complicated. Um, well, this is a one way in which a substitution reaction can take place. Uh, in this case, I have a hydroxide ion reacting with iodomethane. Um, and this mechanism, or the reaction, can take place all in one step. So what's happening is a substitution of the CI bond for a CO bond. So you have to break one bond. right? We're breaking the CI bond, and we have to make a new bond. We're making the CO bond. And that can happen all at the same time, simultaneous. So as if you think about as you go from a reaction uh, from the hydroxide ion on the left and the alkyl halide to the product on the right where you've completely severed the CI bond and completely made the CO bond, um, this is a path that, that takes place in one step. And here I've drawn the reaction energy diagram to kind of show you starting material here, product here. But along the way, the OH is getting closer and closer to the carbon. And as you move along this path, uh, the iodine is moving further away from the carbon. Okay, and there's a point at which that reaches the highest energy. It's a transition state, which I've drawn here, where we have partially bonded CO and partially broken CI. So you think about this as, as a pathway where the, it goes like that. Now, if this happens at the same time, 
in one step, that requires the OH and the I not to occupy the same space. They have to be in opposite sides, 180 degrees apart. There's a geometric requirement for that because you have to you have to make the bond in the same trajectory as the bond is breaking on the other side. And those two atoms, the oxygen and iodine, can't occupy the same space. So they can't come in and go out from the same side at the same time. So if this happens at once, both, this, both making bonds and breaking bonds is happening at the same time. It has to be on opposite sides. And so I've drawn the transition state and the structure that would be at that the, the top of that energy curve. Uh, and you can see the structure is not tetrahedral. It's actually, if you want to look at it, trigonal bipyramidal. Um, but look at what's happening at the carbon. What happens to the other groups on the carbon as you make and break these bonds? Now, I've just drawn, for this illustration, three hydrogens, but there could be other groups on there too. What's happening is that the tetrahedral carbon on the left, bring this up a little bit, the tetrahedral carbon on the left, as the oxygen comes close and the iodine starts to leave, these bonds start to move. And the, the atom actually inverts like an umbrella would on a windy day. Okay? So those three hydrogens are moving halfway through this process, they're all in one plane, as I've drawn here. They're all in one plane. And, and as this bond continues to break and go towards the product, they keep moving in that direction. And so notice I've drawn it here with these hydrogens now back to a tetrahedral, but pointing the other way. Those bonds are pointing the other way. And what we observe in this, these reactions, when there are one-step reactions like this, is that if, if the carbon uh, is chiral, so let me just say, let me just say, for example, we have a, a CH3 group here and a CH2, CH3 group there. Now we have an alkyl halide, which is no longer, um, well, which is no longer just all hydrogens. It's, it's a chiral molecule. Uh, by the way, what is the stereochemistry configuration of that center? <coughs> Remember how to do that? <laughs> S or R? It is R. If you still have trouble doing that, um, make a model, a 3D model, and point it away from you and take a look at it. Uh, it's the R configuration. If we start with the R configuration, and this starts to shift, and these groups are here in that intermediate, and then these groups are here in this, in this product, okay? Now what's the stereochemical configuration? S, so it's inverted. Um, so what we observe is that if we have chiral starting materials, at, and it's chiral, the, chi, the center of chirality is at that halide, which is the bond where the reaction is taking place. And the uh, stereochemistry inverts when we do an SN2 reaction. Now I also want to explain the notation. We refer to this as a SN2 reaction. Um, and SN2 uh, stands for a substitution, so S stands for substitution. The N stands for what? nucleophilic, yeah, nucleophilic, because there are other types of substitutions. And the two, what does the two stand for? Second order. Second order. That means there are two molecules involved in the rate determining step. It's only one step reaction. So the rate of the reaction, here's the rate expression, depends on the concentration of both the alkyl iodide and the nucleophile. So that's what we refer to as a second order reaction. It's a bimolecular reaction. That determines the overall rate of the reaction. Both of those molecules and the concentration matters. So something just to remember, we're going to talk about another mechanism called SN1. Guess what? A first order reaction which only involves the alkyl halide. But that's a two-step reaction. 
So don't get confused. The SN2 is a one-step reaction, and SN1 is a two-step reaction. Okay, so here's that. I guess I could have shown that a little bit better. There's that transition state again. Chirality gets inverted at that uh, center that's undergoing a reaction. Okay, the other thing we observe is that depending on the degree of substitution that the halide is on, we see differences in the rates of the reactions. It's easier to do, this, do these reactions for a molecule which has all hydrogens on it, a methyl, um, versus a molecule which has all alkyl substitutions. So if you imagine that this uh, tertiary bromide, okay, and here's some, some, uh, little, some models to show you, that essentially does not react, the tertiary halide, in the SN2 reaction, whereas, um, uh, if you look at the secondary, and we say that has a relative rate of 1, compare that to the primary. The primary is 1,300 times faster, and the methyl is 221,000 times faster. Okay. Why do you think that reaction would be faster if it's less substituted? Easier to get in. It's easier to get in. The nucleophile, in this case our nucleophile is I minus. We're actually replacing one halogen for another. It's still a substitution reaction. That I minus has to come in from the back side, 180 degrees from the leaving group. So if we have a, a large I minus nucleophile trying to come in here, if these hydrogens are small, there's plenty of room to reach that carbon. But if it's blocked by all of these other substitutions, that I minus just can't get in there. And of course, the, mo the more or less groups we have, the more or less hindered it is. So in order to reach that carbon, and, the, and I think about this SN2 reaction like this nucleophile is actually coming in to help kick off or force that bromine out. Um, at the same time, all the other things have to move as well. So we definitely see the effect of the alkyl substitution of the substrate matters a lot on, on the success of this reaction. Less substituted, better. Secondary can, can undergo substitution in the SN2 reaction, uh, but a tertiary won't. Now the leaving group, um, we're focusing on halogens here, and so I, I, I do want to focus on that, but I want to uh, just talk a little bit about the relative rates of the leaving group. As I said, the bond strength matters for how reactive it is. Uh, here's again, in a substitution reaction, relative rates where I've had a carbon fluorine bond, that this is the bond breaking, the fluorine, these are all the leaving group in the reaction. If the relative rate is one, uh, you can see chloride, um, that's 200 times faster, bromide 10,000 times faster, and iodide, 30,000 times faster. So that's what I was talking about before when we were talking about the halogens series being more and less reactive. Iodine is better. I'm not going to worry about tosylate. Uh, but I do want to point out that things that are less stable anions are harder to break those bonds to form those less stable anions. So if you think about hydroxide or NH2, and again, these would be a carbon OH bond or a carbon NH2 bond. So if these groups are leaving groups, you'll form hydroxide or anion. It's very difficult for those groups to come off compared to halogens. Okay, so uh, something to keep in mind that um, some groups are, are really, even though you have a polarized bond, a CO bond is polarized, oxygen is more electronegative. It's a much stronger bond than a carbon bromine bond. Okay, so a simple alcohol or something like that isn't going to be a good leaving group. Okay, do you remember how we made carbon bromine bonds from a carbon OH bond? Do you remember how we make alkyl halides? 
One of the ways we could do it is to take, for example, an alcohol under acidic conditions, right? And we can actually do that reaction. Think about just what I, I told you. Obviously, a CO bond is breaking, but are we breaking off to form hydroxide in this reaction? No. This only this reaction only occurs under acidic conditions. So we're actually not OH minus doesn't come off in this reaction. What happens, if you remember, is that you first put a proton on. The oxygen, right? Then you weaken the CO bond. Question? This is probably stupid, but what does the TOS stand yeah. for in the first thing? Um, that's a tosylate. I, I mentioned a tosylate in one of the examples in the video about change in stereochemistry. If you want to know, TOS uh, looks like this. I'll draw the structure for you. It's a paratoluene. Sulfonate. So that's the structure. They happen to be really good leaving groups. I don't think your book talks too much about this, so I'm not going to worry about it, but it is a good leaving group and used quite a lot. So when we think about leaving groups, um, something which is generally a really poor leaving group, like hydroxide. We can make that bond weaker by making a better leaving group. The better leaving group here would be a neutral water instead of OH minus. So we know that we can form carbocations and then add bromine and make carbobromine bonds. That's a substitution reaction under a different mechanism. Notice that has multiple steps. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It is possible that instead of the bonds breaking simultaneously, or the bond making and bond breaking happening simultaneously, that you could have the starting material uh, just have the bond break first to form an intermediate carbocation. And then that carbocation can react with the nucleophile. Um, in this case, the oxygen, and it doesn't have to be a strong nucleophile, it doesn't have to be negatively charged either, it could be neutral, um, and you can form um, a carbon oxygen bond where a carbon iodine bond was originally. This happens to be a two step reaction where it's this first step formation of the carbocation, which is the slowest step, okay, the rate determining step. So we refer to this as a nucleophilic substitution, SN1, because the rate of the reaction only depends on the alkyl halide, not the other nucleophile that's involved, not what actually gets added. So a two-step reaction, but it's first order in terms of the rate. It just depends on one molecule, um, and the reaction proceeds stepwise. Okay, now the consequence and the difference of this versus the SN2 reaction, which we just talked about, there's a, there's a consequence in terms of the stereochemistry. Because we form a carbocation intermediate, not, it's not just a transition state, an intermediate, it's flat and planar, right? Although I've tipped it on the side from how we've normally drawn it. It's flat. And so when your nucleophile comes in, whatever nucleophile we're reacting with, it could come in either from this right side or the left side from the way I'm drawing. It could add on either, either lobe of that p orbital. Okay? Because in this case, the leaving group has completely departed and moved out of the way. So now you could have the nucleophile come in from the same side that the leaving group left. Then there's a 50% probability that would happen. Or it could come in from the opposite side. So if we start with a molecule which is chiral, let's say we started with some molecule with our configuration, we would end up with a product as a 50-50 mixture or a racemic mixture of R and S. Okay, so that's, that's one way in which we can tell 
uh, what which of these mechanisms the substitution is undergoing. If we start with something chiral and it becomes and it's racemic in the product, we know it had to go through an intermediate carbocation where that stereochemical information is lost. If we get complete inversion, 100% inversion, we know it had to be an SN2 reaction. It happens at the same time. Okay, so think about this then, this reaction. So what things matter for the success of this reaction? Well, the substrates, leaving groups, they all matter as well, but it's opposite for the SN2 reaction. Because we don't need to uh, come in from the backside and, and try to get a carbon which is to a carbon which is really hindered. The rate of the reaction only depends on formation of the carbocation, the breaking of the bond. So actually, in this case, primary, secondary, uh, methyl—they're very, very slow compared to a tertiary. Only the tertiary, which is um, you know a million times faster or so, almost a million times faster than a secondary alkyl halide. Primary and methyl won't undergo an SN1 reaction. Okay, so that's nice. At least, at least, depending on the alkyl substitution, we can um, actually control a reaction which goes completely SN2 or essentially completely SN1. Because it's all about stability of the intermediate carbocation. Well, here um, uh, compares some of the features, uh, some of the details we've talked about, some we're not, I'm not going to worry about, but the, the key features are the um, uh, substrate substitution and the type of nucleophile. To do, a, to, uh, to do the one-step reaction SN2, you have to have space for a nucleophile to reach the carbon. So the less substituted, the better. So it works best with primary and secondary, not tertiary. You need a good nucleophile, usually a fully charged, negatively charged one, and one that uh, can easily donate its electrons. So you need that nucleophile to be involved. Okay, and the consequence is we see the stereochemistry with 100% inversion from what we start with, if we can start with a chiral alkyl halide. Compare that with the SN1 reaction, where it only depends on formation of carbocations, so tertiary substrates are best, the others won't work, so there's complementarity there. Um, and since carbocations are pretty reactive already, even weak nucleophiles and even neutral nucleophiles, where we would have to take a proton off later, like water, uh, can react just fine. Okay? And stereochemistry would be lost. Process. So those are the three key uh, things that uh, uh, you can compare between SN1 and SN2 and uh, see the differences. Okay, so I did cover all of that in, in the, the video from last week. Um, but there are other things we can do. I, I mentioned there are two possible pathways for these alkyl halides to undergo. One is substitution, where we replace a carbon halogen bond with some other carbon nucleophile bond, either in one step or by forming an intermediate carbocation. Well, we can also do elimination, uh, and there are a few different mechanisms by which that can take place as well. Again, elimination occurs when not only do we have uh, the halogen as a leaving group, and that bond breaks, but it results in formation of a double bond because we've lost a proton from an adjacent carbon. Okay, and it's key, I'm going to stress this over and over. Remember, the proton that comes off is from a carbon adjacent to the carbon with the leaving group, not the same one. I see that mistake commonly done. The result is formation of a double bond. Well, there are some things we observe in this reaction, too, uh, which are quite interesting and, and give us some hints and clues about uh, the reaction process and the mechanism. Uh, one of them was observed by a chemist named Zaitsev, a Russian chemist. And he studied elimination reactions. And you can see if you have something like 2-bromobutane, 
uh, with a, a good base. In this case, the base that uh, he used is the sodium salt of um, ethyl alcohol or sodium ethoxide. So it's essentially a RO minus. That's the base, ethoxide. Um, and if you have bromine, here's the carbon with the bromine on it. And notice you have hydrogens adjacent to that. So you have hydrogens on that carbon. I'll just draw one of the three. And you have hydrogens on this carbon. I'll just draw one of the two there. Either one could be eliminated with the loss of the bromine, right? And then it's not symmetric. It's not the same. So if you take this hydrogen off on the left, and you'd form a double bond here, and the bromine would come off, you would get the first product. And if you took the hydrogen off from that carbon and formed the double bond in between the middle two carbons, you'd get the product on the right. So two possible regioisomers. OK, and science have observed that in, in the cases of these elimination reactions, uh, you generally prefer to form the major product as the more substituted double bond. The more substituted double bond, and we know that more substituted double bonds are more stable than less substituted double bonds. Okay, even though there are three possible hydrogens that could come off on the left, okay, I, you have three chances to form the product on the left and two chances to form the product on the right, but still you get more of this one because the formation of the double bond is uh, better, more stable. Okay, so Zeitz have observed that. What you should remember is that in an elimination reaction, you form the more stable double bond, the more substituted. It's not perfect. You see it's a mixture, but, it's, but it does give, give as a major product more substituted. Okay. Um, well, let's think about this this process uh, a little bit. Um, this reaction has three potential mechanisms, okay, uh, which are referred to as an E1, an E2, and an E1CD. Uh, what do you think E1 and E2 might stand for? Elimination, yeah, first order or second order? In other words, elimination which involves only one thing, which is going to be two steps, or an elimination which involves both the halide and the base and occurs in one step. Okay, similar to SN1 and SN2. There is a third mechanism which occurs in, in very specific situations where the leaving group is very poor. Um, the difference between these is in an E1, okay, now notice we're breaking both a hydrogen and a bromine, okay? In an E1, the carbon halogen is broken first, okay? Then the CH bond that comes off is broken second, in a second step. And I'll go through these mechanisms in detail. But in general, the CX bond is broken first. It'll form a carbocation. And then in a second step, the CH bond is broken. Okay? In an E2 reaction, what do you think is happening to these two bonds? Same time. CX and CH broken simultaneously. Okay. They're both happening at once. And we've seen similar examples of bond making, bond breaking in the substitution analogs. Okay. So if I told you that E1CV is the other extreme, what do you think is happening in that in general? What do you think is happening there in an E1CB? 
It's the other extreme. So if an E1 has the C halogen bond breaking first and the CH bond breaking second, yeah, the CH bond breaks first, but it's coming off as a proton. And then the CX bond breaks second. So that's really the differences. Second. And there, there are three extremes. Well, there are two extremes of these, and then one that happens where both are happening at the same time. OK, and all these do uh, depend on having a carbon halogen bond on an alkyl halide and a base. OK, because you are, in all of these cases, you're losing the equivalent the equivalent of an H plus and a halide minus. That's the equivalent that's coming off. The double bond that's formed in the product, okay, the double bond, the pi bond that's formed in the product, those electrons always come from the original carbon hydrogen bond. So whatever bond we're breaking, those electrons always come from the carbon hydrogen bond. That's what always forms the double bond. The bond to the leaving group halide always goes with that. Okay. So there's some generalities to keep in mind. So let's uh, think a little bit more carefully about these potential mechanisms. Okay, so in an E1 reaction, carbon halogen bond breaks first. So what happens in this? First step for an E1 attack. What's, what's formed? Well, if I were to draw the electron arrows, the only arrows I would draw in this step is the electrons from the bond breaking and going to form to the bromine to form bromine. So we have the product would be the carbocation. Okay, from the example I showed. Carbocation intermediate. And then what do you think would happen in the next step? We form the product. We form the product. Oops. Because, oh, I, should, I guess I should draw the byproduct here. Simply bond breaking, C3R bond breaks to form bromide and carbocation, and then the hydrogen has to be taken off from where it's being broken. And the base does that. So whatever base we're using, I just use base generically there, but it could be hydroxide, could be alkoxide. Um, I'll just use hydroxide. Okay. That base takes the proton and then those electrons go to form a double bond to neutralize the C plus. Okay, and that forms the product plus water. That's the E1 mechanism. CBR bond breaks completely and then the CH bond breaks in the second step. It's taken off by the base. The electrons from the CH bond is what forms the new pi bond of the double bond. Question? Well, um, aside from the base, the, the equivalent that comes off is we've lost an H plus. That's what has, has come off. It's gone to the base. The Br comes off as bromide. But it, overall, if you Think about, well, if you just think about the process without the base involved, HBr comes off. Yeah. So we often refer to it as the elimination of HBr. You need the base to facilitate that. And I hope that's not too confusing. Um, okay, so that's the E1 mechanism. Uh, the E2 mechanism, I don't really have to draw anything on here. Uh, there, are no, uh, there are no intermediates. The base, if I use the same base, hydroxide, would take form the bond to the hydrogen, take that proton off, at the same time those electrons flow down, at the same time 
carbon bromine bonds breaks. So there is no intermediate. It's one step. E2 is one step. And all the bond breaking is happening, and the bond making to the base is all happening at the same time. So if you were to think about a one-step reaction, starting materials, products, okay, and then at the transition state, what might it look like? Well, it might look like something like this. And I'm going to draw dash bonds for those that are partially broken or partially made. Okay. So essentially, you're lengthening the CH bond, you're lengthening the CBR bond, the pi bond is beginning to form, and the, the OH minus is also forming the bond. All that's happening at once in an E2 mechanism. Okay. How about an E1CB? As I said, the CH bond breaks first, and the C BR bond breaks second. So if the CH bond is going to break first, that means your base, in our case we'll use hydroxide, takes the proton off, it grabs the proton, and the carbon bromine bond hasn't broken, what do you think happens to the two electrons from the CH bond? There's no place for them to go. Because the carbon next to it isn't empty yet, or the carbon growing bond isn't leaving yet. So you form, instead of a carbocation intermediate, you form a carbanion. You actually form a C minus. That's the other extreme of mechanism. It's more rare than the other two because it's hard to form carbon ions. And you actually, this example wouldn't even do this because you need something else to help make the negative charge stable. Just like when we form plus charges, more substituted is stable. When we form minus charges, we need something to make that stable. And with a bromine, bromine will leak pretty easily. So actually what happens is you have a worse leaking group. That's why you form a minus charge. But this does illustrate for that example how this might occur in E1CB. And that is the, in a one step you form a carbon ion. In the second step, the bromine bond leaves while the double bond gets formed. Okay, so that's an E1C. In all cases, CH bond breaks and CBR bond breaks and double bond gets formed. Okay, well here is the E2. I mentioned the E2, um, and the rate of the reaction of an E2 mechanism depends on both the alkyl halide and the base. That's why it's second order, because there are two molecules involved. Um, one step reaction, and that shows again the transition state. So if I were to think about the um, reaction energy diagram, it would just be one step like that. Okay, again notice, whatever base takes the proton off and everything happens, everything is happening simultaneously. Now, if that's going to happen, there are some geometric constraints, just like an SMT reaction. If we're doing substitution, the nucleophile has to be opposite the leaving group. Well, if we are doing an elimination reaction, there's also a geometrical requirement for that. The electrons from the CH bond that are forming the pi bond has to form that pi bond to the carbon where the bromine is leaving. And that has to be on the opposite side of the bromine leaving. So in order for those all to be lined up, they have to be 180 degrees apart oriented. So it, since they're on adjacent carbons, 
we can envision this in a new in projection where we have our, our carbon halogen bond here on the front. That's the bond breaking. The p orbitals on both carbons are forming between the two that are front and back, the, the pi bond forms there. The electrons from the CH bond have to be 180 degrees uh, and oriented 180 degrees apart and lined up. What we would refer to as an anti, so H and B are on opposite sides, anti, periplanar means they're all lined up in the same plane. That's the orientation that has to be in place for an E2 elimination to occur. And that's important. If you can't adopt that orientation, there are some molecules which are rigid and fixed and hard to adopt that orientation. It makes the E2 elimination more difficult. So you can see some of the models here, uh, why that would be. Um, in this case, uh, the base and the leaving group, the base would have to take the proton off and the leaving group is leaving. And they're coming close to each other. That's hard. Only in this case, can your base take the hydrogen and have those lined up? Oh, sorry. Not there. Only in this case. anti -periplanar. If the bonds from the CH and the CBR aren't even in the same plane, there's no way you can form the, pi, the double bond at the same time. Okay, so three-dimensional geometry really is critical in this reaction. We see that, uh, for example, here. Here's a good example of it. Remember way back when we talked about cyclohexane chair conformations? So you're not done with that. Cyclohexane, a cyclohexane chair conformation. If we have the cyclohexane, that is the, I'll just draw this, the tertiary butyl group in a one form of the bromine, which is cis, that's the cis isomer, it reacts 500 times faster than the trans isomer, where the T butyl group and the bromine are on opposite sides of the ring. Okay. They both would form the same product. You'd form uh, elimination of an adjacent hydrogen to form a double bond where the leading group was. But this is 500 times faster. Why do you think that's the case? It's because of that need to orient a hydrogen 180 degrees apart on that adjacent carbon. Let's take a careful look at these um, uh, uh, systems. And I'll just show uh, this position here. So we have, in this case, a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here on the adjacent carbon. And in the trans isomer, we have the same hydrogens. We have a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here on the adjacent carbon in the chair. Which one is the only one that has 180 degree in alignment with the carbon bromine bond? These are both 60 degrees from the bromine. That's 60 degrees and that's 60 degrees. They're not 180 degrees apart. Whereas this one here, that uh, hydrogen on the bottom, the axial hydrogen and the axial bromine, that's 180 degrees. That's aligned up perfectly for the uh, elimination to take place, right? So that happens easier. In order for this trans isomer to form the product, which it will, but it requires more energy. And it requires more energy because in order for it to in order for it to undergo elimination, it has to undergo a ring flip. So if I do the ring flip, put the bromine here, that means this large tequila group is going to be here. Now we have a hydrogen 180 degrees apart, this one in particular. It can do the reaction. But this is a higher energy conformation. Notice I have this large tertiary helical group in the axial position. 
Here are the large, oops, here the large tubular group is in the equatorial position. So that doesn't have to go to a high, this one on the left, the cystite mark, it's already in an orientation where the hydrogen can eliminate a lipid bromine. It doesn't have to go flip to a higher energy conformation to do it. The one on the right has to flip in order for the reaction to take place. That's why the one on the right is slower than the one on the left. It's a direct obser observable example of the need for that geometrical alignment anti-periplanar for the leading group and the hydrogen. So by understanding the mechanism now, this observation makes sense. Right? The U1 mechanism doesn't have that requirement because the, the rate determining step is just loss of the uh, uh, halogen. The orientation of the hydrogen could happen later. Yes, the hydrogen has to be oriented with the p orbital eventually to eliminate, but that doesn't matter for the first step. The first step is just breaking of the carbon halogen bond. So the rate of the reaction only depends on the organohalide again. The base is only involved here going in the second step. So it's a, a first order reaction with depending on one molecule for the rate. Okay. Now notice, um, because it all, it all depends on how unstable the halide is and how easily you can form a carbocation, tertiary substrates are going to react faster. Um, and you don't need a strong base. Even just neutral ethanol eventually could take the proton off because the hard part is making the carbocation. The second step, taking the proton, is, is fast and easy. We also observe, as you can see in this example, a difference forming the more substituted double bond again as the major product. That's that Zaitsev tool. This mechanism will only take place if you don't have a strong base, but you have um, ability to form a stable carbocation. Then you'll do the two-step process. Right on the next slide. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to just go back to this reaction first. The one-step reaction. So remember when we talked about substitution. If we were doing a substitution reaction, and it was tertiary, and we have a nucleophile, it can't get in there because it's blocked, right? So for the SN2 substitution, uh, the tertiary substrates don't work. Uh, but if we think about the analogous one-step elimination reaction, does the degree of substitution matter? What do you think? No, the degree of substitution doesn't matter. The difference here is even if these are all substituted there, the base doesn't have to get to that carbon. The base has to get to a hydrogen on an adjacent carbon. Much less problem with these groups here. This can still happen on the left, even if you have these groups here on the right. I think I have a model a few slides later showing that. Let me see. Uh, I thought I did. Yes, here it is. I'm going to skip ahead a few slides and show this is a, a difference. Many times we see competition with um, the environment where E1 takes place also competes with SN1. The environment where E2 can take place can compete with SN2. But the, the difference is um, it's easier for something to reach the Hydrogen, even on a crowded carbon, the SN2 reaction is influenced by the crowdedness, but it can reach the hydrogen adjacent. So it's still a little bit easier. The substitution is less important. 
okay? Um, E1CV. The E1CV reaction is, 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 as I said, it's much more rare and very specific to the type of substrate. I said that we had to have something which stabilizes the negative charge in order to take the proton off before the leaving group leaves. The other requirement is that the leaving group should be a really poor leaving group. Otherwise, it would follow one of the other two mechanisms. Um, so this is a, a kind of a prescribed situation and, and much more rare. In this case, if we have something like this, we can do an E1CP mechanism. The difference is this elimination has a really poor leaving group. OH minus is really poor. Poor leaving group. Okay, so it's not going to come off on its own, and even a nucleophilic substitution, direct SN2 or something, uh, isn't going to work. But if you can generate a carbanion, a negative charge, then you could kick off that leaving group and form a double bond. Now that negative charge is hard to form from a base. What you have to do is take that base and deprotonate one of these hydrogens adjacent. Okay, that base has to come off to form the negative, has to take the proton off to form the negative charge. Notice I have this functional group next to it. These are the situations when you have that functional group, this stabilizes the adjacent negative charge. Okay, only under these kinds of special conditions do you see this E1CB mechanism taking place. So I'll ask the question, how do you think the CO double bond next to the carbanion helps to make it more stable? Yeah, it's conjugated. So this um, negative charge, you can actually draw a resonance structure where you push the negative charge out onto the oxygen. The resonance form would look like this. Okay? Because that's a more stable carbon end than just sitting alone on a carbon, uh, that allows us to take that proton off of the base, form the C minus. And when we form the C minus and we have another group on the other side, which is generally a poor leaving group, but compared to an anion, um, under strongly basic conditions, you could certainly form it. So those are the cases, uh, the more rare cases where E1CV reaction takes place. Um, this is a, a prelude to some future uh, a future chapter where we're going to talk a lot about the chemistry of carbonyl compounds, CO double bond compounds. Um, the ability to take the proton off next to it is one of the main things that we can do with these kinds of species. Okay, so if you think about the comparison, um, sometimes these two pathways compete. Um, as I said, a lot of times when you're in conditions where SN2 takes place, we might see E2 elimination as well. Or SN1, where we form carbocations. If you form a carbocation, you can either add a nucleophile to it, or you can eliminate the adjacent hydrogen. There are two possibilities. Uh, for, and that can matter a lot and again, it's a lot of gray area, and it's sometimes hard to predict. But in, the, in some cases, we can easily say, well, the substrate would dictate it would go this way or that way. The base for a nuclear file would say it should go this way or that way. You can see if we compare these two examples, two bromopropane and one bromopropane, there's a difference in the degree of alkyl substitution. That's important for doing SN2, but less important for elimination. So in this case where it's secondary, notice we react this with sodium ethoxide. We see 13% substitution, 87% elimination. Okay, so this comes from SN2. This comes from E2. Whereas if you use the one bromopropane, now we have a primary bromide. We see 91% substitution, 
SN2, and only less than 10% elimination. Okay. The difference is for elimination, you don't have to worry about the crowding because the hydrogen is further away to take off, whereas in substitution, the crowding is important. That's why the primary substrate does SN2 quite readily compared to elimination. In the secondary, the SN2 is being slowed down and the E2 becomes the dominant pathway. And we see this a lot in when we have all these different kinds of pathways, but they have similar features. Uh, the one that uh, where the features matter more or less tends to well tends to win out or lose out. Okay, so there's an example when we have strongly basic or strongly nucleophilic situation. We have a full negative charge species, an alkoxide, uh, which is a good base. Um, but if substitution is easy, it'll do that. If it's not, it'll do elimination. So it, here's just a, a few generalities. Um, I, I don't want to worry too much about E1CB. Your book actually talks quite a lot about E1CB, but uh, actually most of the cases of substitution chemistry go by the other two mechanisms, and I want to really focus on that. Um, we see that for primary and secondary halides, SN2 occurs pretty good, um, good nucleophiles, but if there are stronger bases, E elimination pathways start to compete, and that really takes place when we have tertiary halides, because substitution is really impossible. Okay? In these cases, though, the thing about highly substituted halides is then you then you have possibilities for forming carbocations, so then you have issues of a different mechanism for substitution and elimination, the two set mechanisms. Okay, and there's a few details. There's stereochemistry issues, there's um, uh, things like that that take place, and we talked about the reason why that's the case. One way to slow down substitution also is not just make the halide more bulky and, and, and sterically hindered, but to make the, the negatively charged species more bulky and sterically hindered. So if you use a base like the tertiary butoxide, this is a, a really bulky base, it's going to enhance the selection of not wanting to do substitution because it's more bulky. It can't fit in there. So we can use that trick on either. We could use a tertiary halide or we can use a more bulky base. And that will favor the elimination process over the direct substitution. So even with a primary halide, where before we got, what, 91% substitution, here it's only 13%. All we've done is essentially change the nature of the base. So we can do tricks like that. Um, Here's an example where we have a really good nucleophile, and cyanide is a very weak base, so it will, it will try to do substitution as much as it can. As a matter of fact, I think even if you had a tertiary halide, if you had something like this, I don't think it, any reaction, I think no reaction would just take place. It would be very difficult to do it with sodium cyanide. So a good nucleophile, very weak base. Tertiary substrates, um, these generally take place under much more mild conditions. If there's any basicity at all, you'll tend to favor elimination pathways. Uh, but if there's no base or no strong base, you'll get um, uh, a just addition to the carbocation as opposed to deprotonation. In both of these cases, you form an intermediate carbocation. Okay. That carbocation could either add a nucleophile to give the substituted product, or as a base, in this case, if you have sodium ethoxide, it'll take an adjacent hydrogen off and give the elimination product. So again, we can mildly adjust the conditions and favor one pathway or another. They both occur from the exact same intermediate. 
Okay, so here's just a summary, uh, which gives a, a little, maybe a little bit better visual perspective on uh, these different features of the molecule. Again, one of the main things to recognize is that primary substrates are never going to form carbo cations. So E1 or SN1 is out, uh, and the competition between SN2 and E2 depends on having bases present. How strong the base is versus the nucleic ballistic. Secondary, sometimes in between. Tertiary, absolutely no substitution in an SN2 would take place. It has to form carbocations. Um, but eliminations can also take place. So bottom line picture is that it's not always obvious, but a few key things could tell us how a reaction is going to proceed with these kinds of substrates. Okay, uh, we're going to finish there. Um, we'll, I have on the next slide a few examples of the uh, competitions between these, but we'll probably get to start talking about alcohols on Thursday.